Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on efficient RF design of Wi-Fi networks. My name is Tom Carpenter, and I'm glad that you've chosen to join us today. We have with us UC from Ekahal, and he is going to be talking us through some of the important factors in designing effective wireless LANs. And the reality is that the make or break moment for our wireless networks is really in the design stage, making sure that we get the right information, that we build the right network plan, and then that that plan is implemented appropriately. So this kind of information that UC is going to be sharing with us today is just essential to having effective wireless LANs. But I have hope for you. If maybe you've already got a wireless LAN and you're finding that it's just not working the way you want it to, well, we can still use the tools that organizations like Ekahal provide to us and this knowledge to go through that network and analyze it and try to figure out exactly what's causing the issues so that we can effectively redesign the wireless LAN in order to make it accomplish our intended business goals and objectives. So this information is important, not just for those that might be getting ready to design a new 802.11ac wireless LAN, or maybe you're even still designing an 11n wireless LAN, but also for those that already have wireless networks and they want to make sure that they're getting the best out of those networks that they can. We always want to update our knowledge and of course, as I'm sure UC will point out, there's been a lot of change in Wi-Fi in the last few years. And so that means we need to think about new things when we're designing wireless networks today. So UC, as I said, he is from Ekahal, and Ekahal makes some excellent site survey tools and other useful tools for wireless networks. And uh, I'm sure he'll share with you some of those tools and their capabilities. But UC, we're glad to have you here today, and I'll turn it over to you and let you begin telling us about efficient RF design. All right, very good. Um, Tom, can yes, you hear sir, me? Can. Perfect, perfect. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining and thanks a lot for Tom and CWNP for giving me the uh, opportunity to do, to do this uh, sales pitch. Oh, I mean, uh, <laughs> webinar today. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, so, so yeah, good to be here. Um, right down to business. So today we're gonna talk about efficient des design or efficient RF design of Wi-Fi networks and uh, just gonna like, kind of introduce how I see people doing things and perhaps provide a few tips that I've learned from the, uh, from the guys that really, really know this industry, really like Tom and, uh, and the other guys along the way. So um, take these as not my advice necessarily, but, but things that I've learned from people who I respect and uh, who seem to understand the business much better than I do. And um, also we'll, Probably, if we have time, we can take a hands-on example of, of uh, like quick RF design of a of a uh, of a decent-sized building. So, um, yeah. Without further ado, let's do it. So, I'm Yussi. Uh, I run the Wi-Fi Design Tools business here at Ekahau. Uh, our website is ekahau.com, and uh, you can find the slides. Actually, I just uploaded the PDFs, so they should be there at ekahau.com/yussi. So um, just go there, download the slides, and uh, there we go. All right. So um, this is what it's all about. Always design the network as if you will take the support calls personally. Nobody puts it better than Daryl. So that's what it's all about, right? A uh, couple of words about the agenda, and uh, I hope you see slides updating as we go if you don't let me know so um we're, we'll go through the usual introductions try to keep it really brief so that we get down to business as quickly as possible and then we'll look at some various tips for predictive design pre-deployment surveys post-deployment site surveys as well as spectrum analysis does that sound fair yeah, sounds like a good plan all right then let's do it so um that's me, uh, joined Ekahau in 2002. If you're not already on Twitter, you should be there because, you know, most, if not all of the CWNTs or the CWNP instructors are there. Um, many of the big names in Wi-Fi are there. Pretty much everybody that's somebody in the Wi-Fi business, except a couple of exceptions like Chuck from Aruba, I'm looking at you. Uh, some of us are not there. But most most of the Wi-Fi guys are on Wi-Fi, and uh, 
if you feel that, yeah, I don't want to contribute into social media, you could just create a Twitter account and fo start following uh, the Wi-Fi guys and girls out there in the industry. So, um, yeah, that's that would be my recommendation. And, uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. I think Tom just sent a message uh, with Tom's and my handles in there. And CWNP has an account. Ekahau has an account. So, yeah, go there if you're not already there. So uh, that's what I think I am, the Kojak of Wi-Fi, right? But reality being that, yeah, that's that's more like me. Anyways, um, before we go any further, CWNP and Ekahau. So why am I here? Um, we worked with CWNP for a long time. Um, I love the stuff from CWNP. Many of our guys and girls have gone through different courses at CWNP. Andrew Campbell, our systems engineer, just passed his, I believe, AP. Uh, he was nervous about it, but he did. And, uh, you know, just got to love their courses. I've, I've uh, gone to a CWNA course actually a couple of times, never did the exam. So uh, call me Mr. No Certifications, but I still love the CWNP stuff, got all the books and all that. Um, and also the C some of the CWNTs or the trainers at CWNP use our stuff in their classes and we are really happy about that. And uh, yeah, I'll be one of the speakers. I'm honored to be uh, speaking at the CWNP conference coming up in uh, September 24 to 26. So um, some of those guys you will meet there as well. Um, Guys like Jerome from Cisco, GT from Ruckus, Keith Parsons, Andrew from Nagy, and Chuck L from Aruba, who doesn't have a Twitter account, by the way, uh, push him toward that direction. So, uh, so yeah, um, definitely go go there. If there's um, a conference you will be attending this year, still uh, the CWNP conference is a very very good choice. Anybody going there? Shoot a chat message now. All right. Um, so, what do you think, Tom? You coming to the uh, to the conference? Oh, yes, I'm going to be there. <laughs> Looking forward to San Francisco. Uh, you, you have. A... Oh yeah, very much so. And so is Anders Nielsen. It seems Anders goes to every conference. I think he hardly works, <laughs> or is he his job actually? Uh, just going to conferences. Jay is coming as well, and Nicholas Mayton is asking to do this in Europe. Yes, so, and we actually do. Tom, we actually do hope of. to do that either next year or the year after. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Anyways, uh, the only sales slide of the day. We do uh, different kinds of Wi-Fi tools. Um, for you guys that run on Windows, Android, whatever. Okay, so that's it. Um, and this is not, uh, I don't count this as a sales slide because we don't really uh, make a lot of money with this, but uh, Keith does Ekahau uh, specific courses where he teaches uh, the use of Ekahau tools, stuff like that. And we have a training site uh, on our website where you can find, you know, uh, videos about how to use our RF planning tools and things like that. And uh, you know, Amanda has hosted 20 or so different videos there. And, and you will find webinar recordings, hopefully also this recording there uh, eventually as well. But um, then, um, and now this. So something totally different. Uh, Harry is our newest guy uh, in the Ekahau team. He works out of the Helsinki office. He makes a master's thesis about the usability and how people use their Wi-Fi design tools and how does the process go and, and uh, are there commonalities in how people design Wi-Fi networks and how could it be improved. So if you want to participate uh, in, you know, improving the RF design process, especially when it comes to the Ekahau Wi-Fi design tools, and even if you're using other tools, doesn't matter, Harry would be very interested in, you, you know, talking with you guys. If you have a half an hour, 45 minutes to spare with Harry, uh, he'd be very interested in, you know, hearing how you utilize your RF design tools, what kind of processes do you use, uh, you know, things like that. The end result we're hoping will be a better product. And Harry is also a professional uh, beach volleyball player. All right. So... 
try to get to the beef as quickly as possible here. So the, this is the point, right? We, we've all seen networks designed and deployed like this. So this is what we're kind of trying to avoid, uh, installing access points, you know, next to metal bars and, and you know, let alone inside, inside metal cages, things like that. We've all been to that hotel where, you know, everything with regards to Wi-Fi works at 6 a.m. in the morning, but come 8.30 a.m., uh, the whole Wi-Fi network goes down because the capacity starts increasing and stuff like that. So the whole idea is uh, not to design and deploy like this. And uh, more pictures like this. Uh, you don't want to end up at Eddie's site. Um, it's badfi.com. Um, that's why we're here, right? Two words about uh, RF and unlicensed spectrum. It's like this, right? So that, um, we are happy to have some unlicensed free spectrum at our usage, which is kind of like a road. And um, then you put some Wi-Fi traffic on it. And if you put too much on it, uh, things uh, get a bit slower. And then um, if you put non Wi-Fi stuff on that road, it's kind of like those sheep where you know, it's just harder to pass those than the, than the cars. And they don't really play nice together with the cars because they don't understand the rules. So uh, that would be like microwave ovens and wireless video cameras and things like that. And as we know, um, you know, the spectrum is divided into two, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, which is like this, and then five gigahertz Wi-Fi, which is kind of like this. So. Pretty basic stuff so far, right? Don't need to be a rocket scientist to realize that, yeah, 2.4 is, uh, you know, pretty old and getting kind of dead. And uh, you probably want to move that stuff uh, into 5 gigahertz as much as possible. But having that said, the IoT stuff and the cheap Wi-Fi devices don't necessarily support 2.4 or 5 gigahertz yet. So you still want to keep your 2.4 on in most cases. All right, uh, this is the traditional, everybody has one of these life cycle of a Wi-Fi network. So the more time you spend planning in these, you know, phases between zero and three and zero and three, six o'clock or midnight and six o'clock, the less time you will spend troubleshooting and monitoring uh, and, you know, extensively monitoring the network. All right. So that's uh, pretty simple stuff, but I like to, you know, keep this, <laughs> keep repeating this slide, at least to myself to kind of you know, keep reminding that, yeah, planning and validation plays a pretty big role here. And um, it's not that simple, though. So Wi-Fi design is really an iterative process where you kind of, you know, whatever the stage, whether you are just doing a simulation design or, or a site survey, um, you kind of work through your options and adapt uh, to changes continuously and uh, we need to remember that the networks keep living all the time. Uh, even walls in the buildings get moved, furniture get moved, uh, things get turned on, like um, you know, microwave ovens, wireless video cameras, stuff like that. So RF is never different from one day to the next. Right. Uh, so when you're doing what would be effective design of Wi-Fi networks, first things first, learn your Wi-Fi and do it the primary source for that today is CWNP, and it's been like that for 10 years. So if you want a state-of-the-art vendor-neutral training, it's CWNP. And then on top of that, to stay current with the very, very latest things, uh, there's the blog. So Andrew Von Nagy's blog, uh, Lee Badman's blog, uh, you know, Keith Parsons's, all that stuff. And to get the blog updates and news most quickly, actually Twitter should be added here. So again, go there, follow that stuff. It's even faster than the blogs. And then there's those vendor specific courses like you know Cisco, Aruba, Ruckus, everybody has their own courses. Highly recommend those as well. They're very good. All right. And this is the thing that um, often is neglected and it's kind of the hard hard piece of the puzzle because it re requires interaction with people usually uh, you know pretty high up in the food chain so but but uh, the more we discuss with the management as well the more we ensure that we you know get to do our job in peace 
and that you know we have enough resources to do that both money wise and time wise it's not like we're making it rain but um you know just need to ensure peace of mind and and uh, the resources to do it learn your tools before you go out in the field so whether you're using uh, you know site survey tools packet analyzers things like that uh, just learn it um, before you go on site and not the last day at your home but uh, you know invest a few days just to uh, just to go through that yep we are recording the presentation as, as Tom just mentioned somebody somebody asked that question by the way Tom I can hear you typing the questions don't worry about it and um, yeah you can find the slides already at etahar.com slash you see and uh yeah we'll we will be recording so um yeah reserve enough time so don't deploy this and before you go on site make sure you have a point of contact there and you've talked the basic things like you know if you're surveying a site you need access to the areas and and you need to notify the staff and things like that and also if you can find out the materials of the facility before you go there that's great and uh, floor plans is one important thing for preparations. We will talk about those in a bit as well. All right. This is super important. So you just need to talk to people, not just, uh, you know, the IT guys uh, where you're designing and deploying the network, but also those network end users. You need to figure out what are the applications that the end users are using and how much they're using it. Best would be actually that you follow the end users in their daily tasks and kind of uh, get a comprehensive understanding on how they use their Wi-Fi devices, what kind of applications they use, um, things like that. You may find that there's some surprising results. And of course, you can use network analyzers like those from previously wide packets to, um, to get statistical data as well, if you have that luxury. That discussion turns into requirements. So, uh, which areas need to be covered? Where can the APs be placed, and where they cannot be placed? The, the AP in the picture probably not a recommended installation procedure. So, as for requirements that you need to look out for in a Wi-Fi network, there's there's uh, the coverage requirements. There's the number of users and there's the applications that are used in the network. And uh, Andrew von Nagy actually had a great webinar today with Aruba about this. Uh, I only saw parts of it because I was preparing for this one. But but uh, Andrew also has, if you Google Revolution Wi-Fi, you will have a find a good capacity planner that's very complementary to ours and uh, lots of good things about high capacity design, right? And when it comes to predictive RF design, so whether you figure out the number of APs uh, using a map or, or using Andrew's Wi-Fi calculator or capacity calculator, uh, you still need to figure out kind of where to place the access points, how to align the antennas, uh, how, how is the coverage going to work, how is the capacity going to work throughout the site. So um, you need to do a predictive design on top of a map. And I'm not talking about a paper map or, you know, um, a drawing with Microsoft Paint where you just uh, draw some circles on it. I'm talking about actual predictive design where you try to simulate how do things work. So um, you need to put in the maps as up to date and accurate as possible and put in the scale as accurate as possible. And um, use the antennas including up tilt and down tilt to make the uh, design really, really accurate. And don't trust an auto planner blindly, all right? And if you're looking for faster predictive design, a couple of good tips is, first of all, get CAD drawings. And uh, we just released a video by Andrew today, which quite nicely goes through a user interface where you instead of drawing the walls in a building you just you know take the walls out of a CAD drawing and design 
a Wi-Fi network or at least, uh, you know, make, make a preliminary design for a Wi-Fi network in 10 minutes, including the wall materials and everything, uh, you know, floor to floor propagation, stuff like that. So you want to check that out from the Echo blog. But the point being, if you have CAD drawings, you will save so much time in your Wi-Fi design work. If you can't get CAD drawings from the uh, from the administrators, then you're stuck with either just going the, the uh, pre-deployment site survey route or making assumptions on the building materials and drawing the walls by hand. All right. Then there's a question from Nick Lambert regarding this. What about CAD files that have like 100 layers? No problem. Uh, the tool just uses those layers that you want it to use. And even if, uh, you know, a layer can consist of a hundred uh, elements of that wall, you know, within within one feet of wall, you can have 10 or 100 lines in the CAD drawing. The tool simplifies that drawing for you. I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. But uh, yeah, exactly. Jay Hammond responded correctly. So turn off the layers that are not needed or they will not be associated. Don't associate them as RF absorbing objects. So no, no worries there. And of course, yeah, you can play with with the uh, CAD software as well and export it in a simplified format. But today you don't need to do that, actually. Any other questions about CAD? We could actually take them now, so we will save some time later on. But yeah, um, CAD drawing, so it takes, let's say, a couple of minutes per floor to bring in a CAD drawing, including the walls and the RF absorbing materials, instead of you having to draw those walls for like an hour or two per, uh, per floor. So, you know, the time savings are enormous. Um, then, when you're actually doing the predictive design, so when you're placing the access points, first, look at the signal strength, whether that's sufficient to meet your needs, NEC67 for voice or, or you know, NEC72, NEC75 for data, what, whatever your coverage requirements, and then start drilling down on the channel overlap. Many of us uh, want to leave automatic RF on and, um, you know, let it do the channeling automatically and nothing wrong with that. You, you can certainly do that or you can manually design the channel plan using RF predictive tools. And um, the, well, even in the tools, there's two ways to do that. The automatic channel assignment manual or a third way, which is a combination of both. Either way, uh, after the fact, look at the channel overlap heat maps to figure out, you know, how much... Uh, harmful overlap do I have, how much CCI, how much ACI, things like that. And then uh, even after that, I would still check the data rate through put capacity heat maps to ensure that, you know, I have sufficient capacity. I don't have too many predicted associations anywhere from clients. I don't have too many VoIP calls per radio anywhere, things like that. All right. So for, for defining what's sufficient coverage, what's sufficient overlap, um, yeah, what are the magic numbers? Well, for example, Cisco provides pretty good guidelines. Every vendor provides pretty good guidelines for designing and deploying, for example, voice grade networks, location ready networks. Typically voice grade means something like signal strength at NEC67 and secondary AP at, NIC, let's say, NEC75, uh, whereas location dictates for let's say three APs audible at XDBM. So uh, I'm not uh, the one to give you exact numbers. I'm just throwing out some examples out there, but ask your experts, ask the white papers. Also Aruba just recently came out with great material by Chuck and his team uh, regarding Wi-Fi design deployment for high density. So there's tons of good material out there. For capacity, this is really what we're talking about, right? The more clients you get, the more problems you will end up having, given that it's easy to design a network that works just for coverage, but to have one that supports those, um, those high number of 
devices when they're really really active that's that's the uh, that's the trick so plan for capacity in terms of you know what kind of user groups you're going to have what types of devices uh, you need to write down the different types of devices and it really does make a difference whether they are you know a b g n or a c for the airtime it makes a world of difference and then you know how many users on each device group and what kind of applications are run on each device? Because it's eventually the applications that eat up the bandwidth, in addition to your 19 SSIDs, of course. All right, when it comes to um, pre-deployment site survey, so now we've finished our predictive design, uh, we've came up with, a, let's say, a plan for it. initially, where could I place the APs? You might want to make sure that uh, you know those places actually are good even in the real RF words, world. So uh, you want to take those APs out in the field, uh, maybe these kind of battery powered mobile APs and just um, perform some pre-deployment site surveys. So take some RF, RF measurements uh, around the APs coverage area. And what you're probably interested in measuring at that point is signal strength and SNR, but also you probably want to check out spectrum analyzer as well at that point, because especially if it's a greenfield site, recording some spectrum captures on a before the Wi-Fi is installed type of a scenario gives you a really good idea on, uh, you know, what's out there besides Wi-Fi. And when you're doing a pre-deployment site survey with these APs on a stick, um, you want to use a reasonable uh, transmit power, not probably max or mean to kind of leave some room both ways. And uh, when you're surveying, when you've reached the edge of the coverage cell, you want to stop walking backward or walking back toward the AP. And you want to use multiple Wi-Fi adapters so that it kind of cycles through all the Wi-Fi channels faster and then gets you the results more quickly especially if you're using multiple uh, APs for your AP on a stick. I've heard people use as many as five or 10 APs on a stick. And then once the network has been designed, uh, verified uh, with an AP on a stick and deployed, come time for one more walkthrough around the site. Once the APs are up and running, the network is correctly configured, you wanna do your pre-deployment site survey. And this is not anymore just for, you know, coverage and SNR analysis. It is that, but it's also about actively testing the network, right? Because you want to make sure that once the network is up and running, that it actually works end to end. So do those active site surveys in addition to your passive data collection when you're doing post-deployment site surveys. And the current Wi-Fi site survey tools out there, they support, you know, using multiple Wi-Fi adapters simultaneously and taking active and passive captures at the same time. For example, with our tool, you can do uh, passive and uh, active end-to-end -end with ping or passive and uh, active end-to-end -end with throughput testing, so iPerf. And obviously, Spectrum analyzers today are really mobile, really handy and low cost. So you probably want to uh, have one to fight in the ferns. Just a couple of quick tips. Spectrum analysis is, is considered, to me, packet analysis is hard. Spectrum analysis, actually the basics are pretty easy. So you just need to, you know, take a few moments to figure out what's Wi-Fi and what's not in your spectrum and how bad is the non-Wi-Fi stuff? And is the interfer constant or periodic in nature? And what kind of noise floor are you having at the site? And Wi-Fi, whereas Wi-Fi looks something like this, there's several Wi-Fi APs on different channels. Non-Wi-Fi might look, for example, like this. Non-Wi-Fi is really anything that doesn't look like those uh, curvy Wi-Fi APs, all right? <laughs> and by the way, a side comment from Cody, David Caruso is a jerk. 
Do you know him personally, Cody, or is this just your assumption of him appearing in CSI and uh, what was it before NYPD Blue? Uh, then there's a question from Raul uh, about spectrum analysis. Yeah, we do, Raul. <laughs> he was over the ramp. All right. So this is really what it comes down to when it comes to spectrum analysis. I wish I had David Caruso's picture here as well. And I wish I knew one of his taglines, but maybe somebody else can imitate him. I, I only can do a, a really bad Arnold impression and I don't want to do that here. So anyway, where was I? Spectrum analysis. Questions before acting. So uh, is the interferer that you, that you think you discovered, is it really impacting your network? Does it have an impact? If not, then, you know, don't worry about it. Can the interferer be eliminated? So can you easily remove that or, you know, switch it off, something like this, or break it? Or can you, can you adjust your network? For example, if the interferer is just affecting channel one, can you switch your AP nearby to be on channel six? And what can work is actually having a Wi-Fi substitute for the interferer. If you think of like a wireless video camera, if it's a non-Wi-Fi video camera, maybe you can replace it with a, a Wi-Fi one that actually plays nice with your network. Then some people like to do um, also this kind of health check type of site surveys where you just go about and, and survey your environment every now and then. But then some people also want to invest in additional infrastructure like uh, the seven signal uh, eyes, which monitor your network 24 seven and provide all kinds of uh, measurements. And they test your network against the KPIs or key performance indicators that you set for the network. So it's best to do both. But if you don't have a constantly monitoring system that, you know, 24 seven monitors your Wi-Fi, then it's probably a good idea to take a walk every now and then where the actual network users are and kind of get a feel for how things are working. All right. So, um, in order to make RF design more efficient, if I wanted to, you know, you guys to remember a few things from today before we go into the demo is um, do the design carefully and use CAD drawings, test and optimize periodically, and, you know, knowledge is power. In other words, this. Now, we could take, uh, there, there were a couple of questions about, um, you know, all these screenshots of the Ekahau tool and stuff like that. So what if we take a quick, you know, opportunity to do a quick RF design of the network and see how, how this actually works. If, if you haven't gone on site, let's say um, we just do an example of the network plan. We're not going to go site survey this, this place. So just make a 10 minute network plan and then we'll open it up for questions. So first of all, and again, I reiterate that it's really important to have high quality maps. So for example, um, DWGs, DXF. So if you can find those CAD files, that's the best way to go about. If you can't, then at least have a drawing where you clearly can see the scale of the building. So I'm just going to say, yeah, let's open that. Out of this five-story building, I'm going to open up one floor plan. I hope you can see this. So here's a typical floor plan. And on the left are the layers of the CAD drawing. And there was a lot of discussion on the, um, on the chat board about, uh, you know, how to utilize CAD drawings, things like that. So this is how, how, how it would really work. So you, you have the wall materials on the left or all the layers of the CAD drawing to be precise. And then um, you just assign those CAD drawing wall materials with something, you know, RF absorbent, like, you know, 
the layer called walls is actually a dry, 3 dB drywall. The layer called windows. What do we got? So let's put that a 1 dB window, so a very thin window. Uh, what else is relevant for a network design? Well, elevator shaft, obviously. But let's do first exterior wall. So you can see the blue color highlighting the exterior walls. I'm going to say that's a brick wall, so 10 dB loss. And you can you can modify these later. So don't, don't worry about it if you go wrong. You can uh, you know edit them by wall segment or uh, you know wall type or single segments of the wall. Don't don't worry about it too much at this point. So we have elevators, we have exterior walls, and then we have doors. Doors are kind of funny because on the floor plan, they're marked as curves, as you can see here with the blue color. So what, what the, the RF planner here does is it automatically actually closes the doors as you assign a material for them. So it looks at those curves and automatically closes them. And as you can see on the bottom right hand side corner, you can see the scale automatically pops up uh, for this drawing. So I'm going to say import. And uh, my poor laptop here is working overtime, so it takes some time for the tool, not just to bring in those CAD drawing layers, but to simplify those, uh, given that uh, one layer even can be really, really complex and consists of you know hundreds of thousands of lines. All right, so here we have uh, the floor plan and the materials associated with it. And as you can see, it made a simplified representation Ooh. Of, of, the, uh, of the whole thing. So when we zoom in, we can still see the room numbers and things, but the colored lines that represent the RF walls um, are actually a simplified representation of the entire CAD drawing, right? And now there's two ways to go, go forward typically. Uh, some people like to use the automatic planner. So first draw the coverage areas or the areas of coverage you want to be covered and then just hit the auto planner button and it will design the network for you automatically. Or you could use the manual planning and say, yeah, I'm going to design and deploy uh, Cisco 3600s or whichever APs you're going to go with and just start placing them manually on the plan. And you will start seeing, you know, how, how the AP actually works, how it goes through walls, stuff like that. So two options, automatic and manual. What I like to do is I like to start with the automatic planner and then fine tune that afterwards for my purposes. Uh, so so I, I get an initial estimate of AP locations with the auto planner. And then I like to fine tune it to find, you know, the optimal locations for the APs and, and you know, let places where the POE drops are. And the lesson here is never trust the automatic pl planner blindly. So blindly. So, um, you know, the computer is never perfect and uh, it never replaces an RF engineer. So even if you use an auto planner and put in everything perfectly, you still want to verify that result by hand, no matter which art planning tool you're used and no matter what the you know, phenomenal marketing literature says, uh, you still want to verify the, and fine tune the plan by hand. Sorry, guys, there's, there's just no way out. But there's a couple of key characteristics that you want to uh, define, whether you're doing auto planner or manual planning. So the minimum signal strength, the minimum overlap or the number of APs, as you can see here, and then the minimum capacity for the network. So this could be a five story building. And I wanted to say, you know, I wanted to, to, this network to support 5000 AC laptops and 500 smartphones. Just going to do a conservative plan here with a few devices here and there. And what's relevant is not just the number and types of devices, but it's the applications used on the device because that really, really um, matters for, you know, whatever capacity you're planning. And this needs to be accounted for. And then the main thing is, are you designing for 2.4 or 5 gigahertz? Because that dictates the AP placement quite a bit, unless you're doing really high density where you want to 
you know, it doesn't really matter. You will have good coverage anyways. I'm going to say five gigahertz and create the plan for next 67. So a voice grade network for five hertz. And this is what it looks like. Not quite one AP per room uh, type, type of a deployment, but still pretty dense. So if I wanted to make it less dense, I could rerun the auto planner or start, uh, you know, moving the APs in different directions, stuff like that. But if we look at the five gigahertz coverage, we can see that, yeah, it may meet the coverage requirements, but it's not that much overkill if we look at just five gigahertz. It's actually pretty good. All right, so that's kind of the, the very basics of coverage analysis or, or uh, so, sorry, Wi-Fi wi RF planning for signal strength. But then the other thing, as I mentioned, is not just capacity, but uh, channel overlap. So, so before looking into capacity, you want to check out your channel overlap. How much overlap do you have per location? Now, I chose the channel overlap heat map and things are looking pretty good. Actually, in, in most places, there's no harmful channel overlap whatsoever. But in this location, I have two APs, APs number three and seven, both on channel 48 on 5 gigahertz. So why is that? There should be room on 5 gigahertz. And this is what I'm talking about. The computer, it just doesn't replace a human. There might be some errors here and there that you want to uh, rectify by hand. So... I could just take that AP, edit its radio, and change it, for example, to channel 52. And boom, that area turns green because now the channel separation is optimal. All right, so that's, that's kind of how. Then you would bring in multiple floors. You would assign the floors, you know, on top of one another. Um, you could do outdoor designs. You could do antenna heights. You could do up tilts, down tilts, stuff like that. We could do a webinar about those things later on. And, you know, you, you can find videos on the internet on how to do those things with different different tools, ours and others. So, yeah. That's that's kind of the very basics of RF anal uh, RF design uh, when it comes to predicted. Now would be a good time to uh, open things up for questions. Okay, you see, and uh, good information provided so far, and you may have more to cover as well. But anyone, if you have questions at all, either about the Ekahal product or uh, general design processes, go ahead and uh, type those into the side chat there, and we'll get those questions answered. Exactly, and there's a good point about capacity requirements that they are always changing. So they, they really are. And when you're defining your capacity uh, requirements into your capacity planner, I'd rather, you know, shoot it over, significantly over the current need of today than under. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, assume that there will be more users in the network. There will be more devices in the network, but don't go overkill. It's not like if your school house is 500 students, it's not like all those 500 students will be actively using three devices at the same time. That's just probably not going to happen within the next couple of years. There's usually, even if the students today have three devices with them, they use max one at a time. There's a question from Tim Ronchetti. You see, I have a six-story building to design. How can I specify client capacity per floor? So currently, uh, the tool takes in, you know, if you do a multi-story building, uh, it does it all at once. So you put in the overall capacity or the uh, capacity of the entire building. But the Tim, your, the answer is this year still uh, you will get a version that allows you not just to do capacity planning per floor but it also does capacity planning you know even per room if you have lecture halls that have you know more students than than the classroom stuff like that so that's coming later this year just actually today we had a meeting specifying that 
Then there's a question from Nicholas. Can the tool redesign according to great masses of people? Yep, you can add actually people uh, using the tool as well. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the beauty of three-dimensional RF design, that you can put in what's called attenuation areas that can have heights. So you could model masses of people into your site, for example, uh, at an auditorium or a school or whatever, and see their impact in the RF design. So, so uh, do we actually have uh, people here as an R RF object? Not in this uh, particular model, but yeah, you can customize your own uh, RF materials and you can put in people there as well. So you would define the height of the people as let's say 1.8 meters or six feet or whatever. You would assign a DB loss for that things like that. Then there was is a question, is AC analysis already included in the tool? And yeah, just like, you know, cars have had it from the 60s, uh, we also have had AC support for a long, long time. If using an antenna that is not in the database of options, can you manually enter the DBI, says Jay. Um, Jay, you can manually, uh, if, you, if you're really, if you want to go all geeky about it, you can put in the antenna characteristics by hand, but that, you know, needs some pretty hardcore configuration. So if I were you and your antenna is not in the tool, just send it to uh, me or my product manager and we will make the antenna radiation patterns happen for you and we will put it into the next release of the tool. And we will also send you a configuration file in a couple of days, actually, uh, that you can already, in a patch format, you can kind of uh, patch that into your tool. So you don't need to yourself define the antenna characteristics of an unknown antenna. We can do it for you. How do you properly model the slope or angle of a grandstand or auditorium seating? I know you can adjust down tilt, but the floor plans are flat. So do you leave tilt angle at zero? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. So if, if, the, if you're modeling an auditorium with a slope, you probably would leave the antenna, depending, of course, on the antenna orientation, but you would leave it at zero if you kind of align it with the slope. So um, th there's no way currently to curb the floor in the tool, but often it's actually not necessary. You see, and, did uh, you see the question from Raul about the um, holes in the floor plan and having rails and safety walls and how you could account for that in the plan? Ah, oh, I, I did not. Can, yeah. can he you says, find he says, what if you have well? holes in the floor and you have rails or safety walls? How can you account that in the plans? So with the CAD drawings, you get the walls, Very but not the heights and etc. Exactly. So you would a um, couple, couple of questions there. So, so uh, first, the hole in the floor, you would use the hole in the floor tool uh, that we introduced, I don't know, a year ago that, you know, creates a hole in the floor and kind of then the al algorithm, the signal prediction algorithm understands that, yeah, there's a hole, uh, signals are going to travel freely from that hole, through that hole. And when it comes to height of the uh, objects, when you, when you bring in the CAD drawings, it doesn't understand the height of the object, stuff like that. Uh, you can modify the walls later on, and this is pretty new. So you can just you know select the wall material you brought from the CAD drawing. Let's say you assign the shelves uh, in the CAD drawing to be retail shelf, and there was no height associated with it then, you can actually put in the height here. Just press the wheel and set the height here. What about uh, Khan asks, which is a good question. What about the throughput test part? Um, yeah, so throughput testing in Wi-Fi and in anything really, uh, it's a form of art. First of all, bear in mind when you're throughput testing Wi-Fi, it's a very momentary uh, thing. So if you're running a live network with live users, you know, throughput Everything will, will vary in a Wi-Fi network, but throughput especially varies from one moment to the next quite a bit, depending on the environment, what are the other users doing, 
everything. But if you want to do throughput testing uh, still, and, and many do, and I can totally understand why, you can do it quite easily. Just go go here, uh, and instead of the default ping active testing, which works without configuring a server, you would select throughput. You would install a th uh, our own throughput server component. You can use others too, but but we needed to rewrite one because uh, we didn't find that the existing throughput servers were really stable with Wi-Fi testing. So um, you would install a server component on a computer that's in the network and the server computer would be probably hooked up with a wire somewhere in the network. Then you would connect the site survey tool with that server component by simply saying, yeah, I want to do throughput testing, put in the host IP here, whether you want to do UDP or TCP testing, and then just setting the parameters here. And um, if you measure UDP, you will also get, uh, you know, you you will just get more information than from TCP. With UDP, you get things like packet loss, uh, jitter, which is jitter, for example, is really important for voice over Wi-Fi testing because it tell, talks about the variance uh, in the delay. All right. What tips can you give us on passing the CWNA test? Tom, that one's for you. Well, that's a that's a really great question. And, you know, it comes down to studying to the objectives is the big thing. So what I always tell people to do is make sure they take the objectives document out and use it as their baseline. Because a lot of people make the mistake of getting a study guide or something like that. They read the study guide and they don't really go back to those objectives and check them off and say, yes, I, I know I understand that because the exam is written to the objectives and it's just a great tool in those last couple of weeks before you sit the exam to sit down, take that objective, print it out and literally go through the objectives and ask yourself, can I honestly explain this without looking at anything? Uh, because if you can really explain all of those terms and those uh, concepts and those processes that are listed in the objectives, then you'll be in the place where you're well prepared for the exam. So uh, that's really for me. And I do that actually, by the way, you see, I'll, I'll add that I've taken tons of certifications throughout my career. You know, I started back in the early 90s and um, I've taken a ton of certification exams. And that's been my process before I go take an exam every time. I always get those objectives and I just go through them and ask if I if I needed to explain all of this to someone, could I do it? And if you can, your odds of passing that exam are just super good. So that's something that I've always done myself and I've always found it helpful. Uh, in fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I took an exam uh, test for uh, CASP, the CompTIA Advanced Security Practitioner, because I always like to keep on taking exams and staying fresh on what's going on out there. And, um, and it was a very challenging exam, but all I did is before I went and took the exam, I didn't really study for it. I just looked at the objectives and I asked, do I know this stuff? And so since I did, I was able to jump in there and take it. And it was a very hard test, but I passed it. And so uh, that's just been my measure. If I can go through the objectives and explain it, I feel good about it. So now doesn't Ekahal have some certifications or something like that for their products as well? We sure do. We sure do. That's a good question. We have the Ekahal Cert by the survey engineer, which takes you through, uh, you know, extensively hands-on utilizing the products. And uh, Keith Parsons is hosting most of those uh, training classes. In fact, we are happy to be joined by Keith tomorrow here at the Finland office because he's just finished up his ECSE uh, or Ekaho Certified Survey Engineer class in Stockholm. It's a great three-day course if you're into, you know, getting really, really hands-on with our products and, and absorbing some of Keith's wealth of knowledge, uh, then I'd highly recommend it. And if you go to ekahow.com slash training, you will find it all there. Um, also, Devin Aiken, uh, you may know him as well. He's filling up for Keith on some of our training classes. So so it's a, yeah, uh, an honor to have those guys in our lined up training Wi-Fi using our tools. Definitely a powerful background behind both of them with knowledge of Wi-Fi. So they'll bring a, a lot of that to the table too. You, you know, if you're in a class with them, you're not, you're not just going to learn where to click. You're going to learn why the things happen like they do when you click there. So precisely, precisely. They, they both have a history with CWNP. Yep, Devin was a founder. Uh, Keith involved very, very early on. He's one of the early CWNEs and 
And he's currently right now actually one of our board of advisors for the CWNE board, which approves CWNE. So nice, nice. And uh, what you're already above 160 CWNEs, That's right? Yeah. Um, th there's a good question from Philip Justin. Uh, can I track Spectrum and Wi Fi data at the same time and save it to view it later, like the measurement points? Uh, spectrum data. That's the so we have two major things under development right now. The one is the capacity area, so so uh, improving the capacity planner and, and adding high capacity areas, and the other one is spe uh, spectrum analyzer integration. So wait until let's say late Q3 ish, and uh, the spectrum analyzer will be integrated with the product. Okay, do we All have right. any more questions? We've got just about three minutes left here. So if you have any other questions, we'd love to hear them. Exactly. Spec and integration is going to be with MetaGeek. Correct. Correct. With our, our own stuff and MetaGeeks, which is essentially the same product, to be honest. Uh, any questions regarding the CWNP uh, stuff? Still not. We have Tom on the line. I'd like to, uh, you know, you guys take, take advantage of him if, if you're still going through exams or, or considering courses. Uh, I've gone to the one by, um, was it Wireless Training Solutions? And uh, I also know Robert Bartz really well. So Robert Bartz does a boatload of trainings for CWNP and I would really highly recommend his courses as well. Does Eka How have their own uh, survey adapters? We do have our own survey and adapters indeed. And uh, currently they are 802.11 in. And I was actually today just testing the, the forthcoming AC stuff as well. Uh, but but so the currently available is in, but that's for passive survey. So, so there's two things here. Active survey, which in our tool works with any adapter. And there you want that AC capability to, you know, uh, get those high data rates and get the throughput uh, with AC, things like that. But for me, even when we come out with an AC adapter, I still like to say use the highest quality adapter in terms of RSSI and noise readings for the passive survey component. And the technology matters as long as you can, or doesn't matter as long as you can read inside the packets and say, this is an AC access point this is an in access point, you know, these are the MCSEs and stuff like that. So our in adapter can read the MCSEs from the ACAPs and thus display the channel widths correctly and stuff like that. But what's most relevant thing about our own USB adapter is it's consistent when it comes to reading signal strength and it even does a decent job at reading noise levels. Of course, not spectrum analyzer quality, but it's still all right. So you can use, you know, up to even four adapters at the same time. Some may be AC, some may be N uh, to get the best survey results. Then there's a question. Can the Netgear A6200 USB adapter be used with Ekaho for active AC surveys? Yes, Carl. Good to see you, Carl. Absolutely. Any Wi-Fi adapter can be used for the active uh, 80211 AC surveys, or you can even use a B adapter for active surveys if you want, and throughput surveys for that matter. All right. If that's all, thank you so okay, much, Okay, you see, thank you too. I do, do appreciate. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, CWNP, for arranging this. Much, much, much appreciated, and I'm honored to be speaking here. So, uh, yeah, let's let's do this again. And actually, Tom will be joining us later in the summer for an Ekaho webinar. Yes, that's correct. Right? And um, in addition, uh, throughout the summer, we'll be doing some of our own webinars on Wi-Fi design. Um, we're leading up to a release of a new version of the CWDP certification this fall. And so uh, we'll be releasing some webinars in the months of July and June and August that are focused around design. And it will be a lot of uh, a theory, getting into the deep theory of design and why we want to build our networks the way we do. And um, we'll probably even be talking about why 2.4 gigahertz should hopefully rest in peace. 
So uh, we'll be going over some really important stuff this summer, too, in those webinars. So watch for those to come. And remember our conference. You can get more about that at the website. Make sure you check out Ekahau's website and get information from them. And uh, you see, with that, I'll give you the last word for anything you'd like to say in closing today. Thank you so much, Tom. I really look forward to uh, talking to you again in the next webinar. And I, I'll be sure not to miss your next webinar at the CWNP.com. And hey, one more thing. I hope to see you in September at the CWNP conference. Excellent. Hope to see you there too. And uh, everybody, thanks for joining us. And uh, did notice one quick question about the um, uh, webinars and how you get informed of the schedule. You can subscribe to our newsletter at CWNP.com. And we email out the schedule every month. We give you the next three months of webinars. So they'll be in there. And therefore, you'll have that. And uh, finally, is the CWAP up for renewal? Well, uh, it is, but it's coming after CWDP. So CWDP will be first. And we'll probably have CWAP updated actually by the end of this year as well. So uh, that's what we're looking at at this point in time. So everyone, thanks for joining joining us today. And uh, if you're studying for CWNP certifications, good luck with your studies. Always feel free to contact me. Again, you can follow me at Carpenter Tom on Twitter. And uh, you can always email me directly. I'm just Tom at CWNP.com. So UC, thanks for joining us and we'll say goodbye to everybody.